What up, guys? Your boy Quake back with a brand new episode of the Diverse Mentality Podcast, number 270, powered by Golden Eagle Energy Drink right here, guys. Get it. They're sponsoring all of season four. We appreciate them wholeheartedly. Go to drinkgoldeneagle.com forward slash DMP. While you're listening, the link is in the description or you're hearing, just drinkgoldeneagle.com forward slash DMP. Show them support for showing us support. Now, uh, before we get into everything, I want to apologize, which I kind of knew this was going to happen because I was facing issues with the live stream. Again, uh, I, I figured out a lot of the stuff in the live stream that was going wrong, fixed it. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of it just had to do with like updating certain softwares and then some softwares not working with other softwares. It's a whole, whole issue. And then I was having issues with if somebody calls in, could you hear them on the live? And that's where I was running into issues with and I couldn't figure out. So I was like, you know what? Let's just reschedule. So uh, with Ramadan coming up, if you guys don't know what Ramadan is, Muslim, if you're Muslim, uh, you celebrate Ramadan, you're fasting for 30 days. So it's going to be a little bit harder for me to potentially go live on stream. If I do, though, it's going to be a little bit later after I eat and actually because I don't want my mouth to be dry and then you guys are just hearing a bunch of like that type of noises with my mouth because, you know, you, you're not allowed to drink or um, eat till, you know, from sun up to sundown, basically. Um, so, you know, I have to figure out when I'm going to reschedule. I was planning next Friday, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. So we'll see. The live stream thing, I'm going to figure out. Don't worry, guys. We'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. But uh, something crazy happened these past couple of days, something that I didn't expect. And what I'm about to be talking about right now has nothing to do with hip-hop. It is something that I just grew up with as a child. And uh, I got to show my condolences and respect to this person because uh, this person meant a lot to me growing up. And I'm almost getting watery eye just talking about it. Uh, Akira Toriyama passed away at the age of 68. If you don't know who Akira Toriyama is, he's a Japanese manga writer, creator, drawer, whatever the correct term is. And he's responsible for creating Dragon Ball. Now, he's done a lot of huge huge things like he created dr slump created uh dragon quest created a lot of different stuff but he's mostly known for dragon ball and then eventually dragon ball z and then eventually dragon ball super and then this upcoming series dragon ball daima however you pronounce it this is the last from what we know is the last series he's actually worked on while he's alive uh you know i don't know if he's got anything else that he had under the works that people you never revealed but dama i believe that's how you pronounce it d-a-i-m-a is the last Dragon Ball type series that we're going to get from him since, you know, he was alive. Um, now, you're probably wondering, why am I not saying Dragon Ball GT? Well, he had nothing to do with Dragon Ball GT, but he still respected it and loved it regardless. He just had nothing to do with it. Um, so that's why I didn't mention Dragon Ball GT. But um, if you don't know what Dragon Ball Z is, then obviously, you know, I think you've been living under a rock because Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z broke cultural barriers. Like, you know, Everybody in the world knows like Goku might be one of the most famous characters of all time. I'm willing to bet that with quite a, quite a, I think everybody knows who Goku is at this point. Even people who've never watched the show at least know Goku, you know? So, um, he created it. He did it really out of spite. Uh, he, he, he needed some money, decided to enter. If you don't know what Shonen Jump is, it's a popular manga magazine in Japan. It's popular here too. And it's, you know, it's spread throughout, but that, that platform uh, was doing a contest and they were offering money and whoever got first place wins the money. Unfortunately, he got last place. He entered again in a different contest, got last place. And because he placed last, as if his work was just the worst, that fueled him. That, that got him so angry that he decided to prove people wrong and decided to create, uh, I believe Dr. Slump was the first uh, like cartoon series, whatever he created. And that, that was a huge success that eventually went on to Dragon Ball. And then eventually, you know, Dragon Ball Z, so on and so forth, and lots of other things in between. You know, I don't know his history perfectly, but I know that's how a lot of these things started with his career. Um, so him passing away brought tears to my eyes because this guy, you know, shaped my childhood. And I said this on Twitter, um, you know, we came to America in 1999. And by basically 2001, we started getting familiar with like American culture and, you know, what's what kind of car what kind of cartoons people watch. And, you know, it took a little while, but we, we got adjusted to a lot of stuff. We didn't have cable though. That's the thing. 
we had cable on and off. So my parents, you know, we couldn't really afford it. So we had it on and off. And then there'd be times where we had cable. We could watch the things that we wanted to watch. Sometimes we wouldn't, but then some things would be free even without cable. Like you would have a uh, the WB, I think it was called at the time. Now it's called like the CW, but four kids TV and all that other stuff, Fox kids and all those free channels that had a bunch of cartoons. So that was cool. Um, but Dragon Ball Z was unfortunately on a cable platform, cartoon network. You had to pay for that. So, uh, sometimes I would get to watch, sometimes I wouldn't. Uh, I want to tell you guys two major memories that I have of Dragon Ball Z. There's a lot, but these are the main ones that pop in my head. Uh, my brother's friend was into Dragon Ball Z before us because he had cable. He actually got a chance to watch it. We didn't, you know, we would have to go to his house to watch it. But I remember um, first time getting introduced to Dragon Ball Z. Now, why I remember this so vividly is because my brother's friend got into uh, an accident. So he was laying in bed, like pretty much, you know, all bandaged up. Like he looked like he just got burned alive. Like basically, um, he was in a bad, bad accident. He didn't get burned alive, but he just broken arms, broken, whatever the hell. And he was laying in the bed. That's the first time we saw him. So I remember that vividly. And I remember him laying in bed watching Dragon Ball Z. And this was around the time when Trunks first gets introduced. So he comes in, Trunks comes in all cool. Uh, destroys freeze in seconds. I don't remember which exact episode we were watching at that moment, but I do remember it was around that trunks when he came, you know, first on earth and, uh, you know, started, you know, having back and forth Frieza, destroying his father, all that stuff. And I just remember being the entrance was so cool. I was like, who, what is this? Who is this guy? What is this show? Seeing Goku, you remember the intro where Goku stands in the middle and everybody's around him. He turns super Saiyan. Like all that stuff was just so cool. And, uh, you know, my friend told my brother about it, and my brother was like, wow, this is amazing. I think my brother already knew. I could be wrong. Um, but I remember him telling, you know, about Trunks and you know, all these characters and how amazing it is. And then every time we try to go to his house to watch it because we wouldn't have cable. And then sometimes when we did have cable, we did catch up on some episodes. But it was really on and off. And that's why I started falling in love with the show. And I think Dragon Ball Z influenced me just as much as G-Unit did, because it was G-Unit and Dragon Ball Z. It was 50 Cent, Banks, Buck, G-Unit, blah, 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 G-Unit, yelling that shit out 24-7, and then it was Dragon Ball Z. Like, those are the two things I remember very vividly, like, just going crazy over, like, music, hip-hop, obviously, in general, but anime and cartoons in general, but mainly those two were, like, my number ones. So, the other memory that I have, there's quite a few of them, but the other memory I have, which was funny, is that we were in the fourth grade at this time. I was in the fourth grade and we were playing a game of, uh, what is it called? I think it's called charades. Yeah. Charades where you have to guess what the person, uh, what, what the thing is by like saying the things surrounding it, I guess, or like saying the things that are close to it. Like, let's just say you have tooth toothbrush, right? You say this, you use this thing to brush, to, uh, to clean your teeth. You don't say brush teeth because that's in the actual title, the, the, the word. But you just say you use this thing to clean your teeth. Uh, it goes with uh, fluoride or whatever, tooth, not toothpaste. I don't think you'd be able to say that. But regardless, you say things that are close to it, right? And then the person has to guess what it is. So we're playing that charades. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm like losing my voice here. We're playing charades, and uh, the, the reward was, hey, it was, it was basically practicing for a quiz that we had, but the reward was we get candy if we win. And being my luck, my shitty luck, I was the last one to go, and it was a tie game. So at this point, I was like, okay, if I lose this, they win. If I get this, we win. So it's really that, that simple. And if you guys know the piccolo flute, you know, there's a flute called piccolo. And if you know in Dragon Ball Z, the green character, piccolo, that's his name. The Mechian, anyways, I know a lot about Dragon Ball Z. I'm watching actually Dragon Ball right now. But um, I remember my friend turning around and was like, okay. He just straight up looked at me and was like, the green guy in Dragon Ball Z. Off the rip, I knew Piccolo. I was like, Piccolo. And boom. Everybody's like, ah, oh, yeah. Ah, oh, you nailed it. Blah, blah, blah. Everybody's happy. They got candy. The other losing team was mad. But that literally saved, you know, me from losing that game, which was a huge memory. I don't know why. It's like a memory that I have vividly. My friend turning around saying the green guy in Dragon Ball Z. I was like, okay, that's Piccolo. I mean, what else? Who else is? Obviously, there's Namekians. I could have said Namekian, but... Piccolo is the thing, and you only had a few guesses, so I'm glad that he said that. But that's how close I was to Dragon Ball Z, and everybody knew how much I loved Dragon Ball Z. And yeah, I mean, I, it's not just me though. Like all of the world loves, grew up on Dragon Ball Z. If you were a '90s kid, 
you know, you pretty much grew up on Dragon Ball Z. And a lot of different shows as well, too. I mean, there's a lot of amazing shows. But, um, yeah, and then I just remember we were get, we would get cable sometimes, and there would be a lot of reruns of the Boo Saga, and I would end up grabbing a cassette and recording uh, each episode that would come because I would want to watch it later on, not knowing that now in 2024 we have streaming and we can literally watch any episode we want. But back then I would record them on tapes, buy new tapes, try to buy new tapes so I can record them. Sometimes I would find uh, VHS uh, episodes of Dragon Ball Z for sale, I would actually, I remember, yeah, there would be a lot of different types of, and I would end up buying, I mean, you could, on the VHS tapes, you could, like, pack them all together to make, like, an image, if you had, like, one saga and stuff, so there's just a lot of stuff, man, that I remember, I have, I still have the Dragon Ball Z cards from when I was a kid, and I still buy some of the Dragon Ball Super cards that come out, um, because my Dragon Ball Z cards, certain ones are worth a shit ton of money, I've completed all of the Bobbity Saga, uh, limited and unlimited set. And I looked up a, a limited set and an unlimited set. And they're like the whole set's going for like 10000 One card's like $3,000. It's an ultra rare that I have. Uh, and I'm just leaving them. I'm never going to sell them unless, God forbid, I end up in like financial hardship and I have to sell them. That's probably like one of the things that I would have to sell. But, uh, you know, they're just there. And I, I remember collecting them throughout the years and just never selling them. Just love. I never played the game because it's so difficult to understand. I mainly play Yu-Gi-Oh! Because I just love the Yu-Gi-Oh itself, but uh, yeah, man. Uh, sorry for going on this insane rant, but that that you know, um, uh, this guy means a lot to me and means a lot to the world. And if you look online, there was all love and praise. Um, globally, we're talking presidents of different places. We're talking leaders of different places praising him, showing love. China, China, which is like insane. The fact that they they acknowledged him, even the Japanese. It's like it's. It's insane. He, 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 this guy did something that like, and he was so humble and so honest that he, he talks about his writing process and how much he procrastinated. And he wasn't, he wasn't this like, you know, people have this thing with a lot of hard workers and people that make it successful that they just, they constantly work 24 seven, but especially as a creative and I've learned this and I'm glad that I saw this with Akira Toriyama and his writing process is that sometimes procrastinating it's how you get creative ideas. You know, um, that's what happened with me with the Give It Your Die Trying documentary. There would be literally weeks that would go on where I just couldn't work on it. Just nothing was coming to my head of what to do on this part and what do I, how do I mix this with this? Because you have to come up with a lot of ideas of how to execute certain things so they flow well. And it just, it wasn't coming to my brain. So then procrastination, just not working on it and just kind of getting away from hip hop related stuff. I did that for like two weeks. And then finally one night, I just sat down at night at the computer and just everything started flowing. Within a week, I pretty much completed the documentary. It was like insane. But knowing that he had that same type of process, he had that same type of thing where like he would procrastinate and do things last minute like me, um, you know, it makes me feel good about my process. How I do things. So I always, in my mind, I used to always think, oh, people will work hard every day and they just on it every day. Nah. I mean, sometimes you just got to, you know, unplug and, you know, procrastinate pretty much. Nothing wrong with procrastinating here and there. As long as you're not doing it to the point where it's, affecting you completely in everything that you're doing but procrastination is nothing wrong with that um but seeing that and then just seeing how humble he is as a creator uh, you got to ask the question that if you know if you were to be reincarnated like, what would you be reincarnated by like if you were to die and come back what would you come back as and what would you do uh he was like same thing i'm doing right now but better way better than what i do so he looked at his work as not that great you know and that's pretty much a lot of people a lot of people that are creatives that's how they, you know, view things. They, they want it to be perfect. Uh, I have my moment, moments where I want things to be perfect. Even the Give or Die Trying documentary, there are moments where I'm not happy with it. Actually, there's a moment that I upload, like the full thing uploaded, that I noticed last minute after the upload, and it pissed me off. But since the time was coming, I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to live with it and let it be a, a thing that reminds me of not to fuck up ever again. And if you guys look at the Give or documentary, there's a portion there's a part where Red Spider's talking. I think it's Red Spider or Rockweiler. And the DM Originals logo is like on the other side because I had messed around with what where to place it. And unfortunately, I didn't switch that clip to where to place it. So like if you watch the Gibberish, I'm sure people probably didn't notice or didn't even give a shit. But to me, it pissed me off that like it wasn't in the same spot for every clip. Like anyways, that's just small things like that that just make me so mad that I'm like, why did I fuck this up? I just like beat myself up over it. But 
Uh, yeah, I just wanted to give my condolences to Kira Toriyama, his family, friends. Uh, he inspired me, inspired the world. Uh, this guy is somebody that, that did something that only a few select human beings on earth will ever do, and that's transcend cultures. He is a Michael Jackson level. Like, he transcended cultures. He is not just, you know, he wasn't stuck in this one thing. Everybody in the world knew about him loved him. Uh, I actually had him on my podcast list of people to interview. That, like, if it was my dream list of people that outside of hip-hop, who would I love to interview? Inside of hip-hop, I had DMX on there. He passed away, unfortunately, so I can't do that. Outside of hip-hop, I did have Akira Toriyama, but it's unfortunate. Um, I won't get to interview him because, you know, he's gone now. So, uh, but yeah, I just I just wanted to give respects to him. I know somebody wanted me to do a Dragon Ball Z documentary. This is why I think documentaries are important, guys, because people pass away and we rarely got any interview clips from Akira Toriyama, anything. Like, it would have been amazing to get a 40-year anniversary Dragon Ball Z documentary. Like, it's been our 25-year anniversary documentary, 30-year of Akira Toriyama talking and all the voice actors. And, you know, but I don't think we'll ever get that. I don't know. Maybe they're working on behind the scenes because the 40-year anniversary is coming up. But, you know, I wish I would have loved to do that. Like, I would have loved to make a documentary, talking to all of them, sitting down with them talking about everything that they've gone through the hell and the good the bad everything you know i don't know that's why i think documentaries are important that's why um you know that i made the get rich one and if i if i get blessed to do more in the future like that like that get rich one where i get to travel and actually talk to people in person i would love to do it so uh yeah rest in peace to kira Toriyama, man legend 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 uh we appreciate you for all the hard work and never giving up uh he did pass away too from and this is usually from hard work, actually, for, from stress, too. It could potentially happen. The statement said the cause was acute subdural hermatoma, a condition in which blood collects between the skull and the brain. It did not say where Mr. Turiyama died. So he did, when the news finally got out, it was like a lot later. He died like March 1st instead of like when it got out. I think it got out like March 4th, 5th, 6th, something like that. So, uh, but yeah, this guy is... You know, legend, man. There's nothing more I can say about this guy. There's, there's not, not much you can put into words of how great he is. So uh, he influenced, oh my God, all these other shows that you're seeing after all got influenced by him. I mean, they all came out and said Bleach, One Piece, uh, Naruto, whatever, any anime or anything, even not just anime, man. It transcended it to hip hop, transcended it to everything. Um, so much respects to him, man. Let's get into the news. Dame Dash has responded to Steve Stout and... It's a typical Dame Dash response. So Dame Dash has promptly hit back Steve Stout after the music manager criticized him for how Rockefeller Records fell apart. I showed you guys in the last episode of the podcast, he was on Club Shay Shay, basically said, you know, uh, Dame Dash is hard to work with. He didn't mature and um, yeah, stuff like that. So um, Dame Dash responded, responded and commented on Instagram and said this. Dash promptly hit back Stout's comments on Instagram writing. This is the reason I had to smack the shit out of Steve Stout a couple years ago because he's always speaking on other men's business. Good thing I've evolved. <laughs> That's a good uh, play on words. Um, Dame Dash previously claimed he had claimed to have attacked Steve Stout over a debt telling the comeback Jack show in 2014. I had been playing basketball in the Hamptons and I broke my foot. I was like, by the way, you owe me 18000 He was like, I'm not paying you. So I limped over and said, yo, I think you need to get out of my office and I'm not condoning this. I'm not proud of it, but I smacked the shit out of him. Hey, 18,000 is money, bro. So but yeah, Dame Dash is not one to be shy about putting hands on people. We've heard about lots of different things in offices happening like that. So uh, that's Dame's response though. I think, um, you know, I think Steve Stout has a lot of these moments where he just, he just talks about people and I get I get it. he gets asked these questions but you know if he gets confronted by it it's a totally different thing like we never got a full reveal of what 50 said to Steve Stout it's that infamous photo in 2014 where he sees him at the Knicks game and he's like pointing his finger at Steve Stout's face and like really getting aggressive um we never got like a like what did he say to him? he basically 50 said something about joking like he was like um uh, you know, why are you talking? Like, he says something like, uh, Steve, now you're talking all this. I'm going to move the needle. I'm going to get a hit. Well, 50 was wrong at that moment. He didn't get a hit. He he said Smoke, which Smoke was a great record off Animal Ambition. But 
it wasn't a hit, man. 50 didn't get no hits off Animal Ambition at all. Um, so Steve Stout was right. Steve Stout was criticizing 50 in his music, saying he fell off and, you know, like, you know, he could be such a greater artist. And I agree, man. I think 50 took a route of, he took a route that he could have gone more personal in his music. Could have gone a lot, you know, take, he could have took different routes instead of just the same gun talk. And not saying that that's all 50 talked about because there are records where he gets personal sometimes, but, you know, 50 has way more ability than, than that, man. And Get Rich shows that just off the rap, off the rip. Massacre showed that. Um, so, yeah, that's a whole different story. But, yeah, that's the Steve Stout and Dame Dash issues. And Steve Stout's got issues with 50, but then 50 sees them. It's cool. Steve Stout's got issues with Kanye. And then, I don't know. So, it goes back and forth, Steve Stout, with a lot of these things. Uh, Lil Wayne. Lil Wayne has settled a lawsuit with her former chef. So, we reported on this, like, a long time ago. Her, uh, Lil Wayne's former chef sued Wayne, and then uh, I don't remember what the issue was for, but uh, let's go over the article. Lil Wayne and his ex-personal chef have settled their lawsuit amicably with the letter bringing it against the rapper, with the latter bringing it against the rapper for allegedly engaging in wrongful termination. KTLA is reporting that the suit was settled as of Thursday, March 7th, according to papers filed by the attorney for Morgan, Morgan Medlock. Uh, terms of the settlement were not disclosed, but the parties reached a settlement two days prior to the relevant paperwork being filed with the Los Angeles County Superior Court. Judge Kristen S. Escalante accepted the terms of the settlement, which concludes a long and rancious battle that began in December 2022. So yeah, it's been a minute. Uh, when Medlock first accused Wheezy of wrongfully terminating her for, from her position as his part-time personal chef. Medlock said the issue first occurred when she accompanied Wayne on a Memorial Day trip to Las Vegas and had to suddenly leave when she was notified that her 10-year-old had sustained a head injury that left him hospitalized. Though they already boarded, Wayne's private jet returned to L.A. He reportedly... Though they all boarded, Wayne's private jet to return to L.A. He reportedly severely... This, this article, man, the way they write these things. He reportedly severely delayed. That makes no sense. He reportedly severely delayed. Yeah, delaying. It's delayed the flight by smoking on it. So she hopped on a different flight. Medlock assumed that the rapper's team would understand the situation, especially because she was two years into the gig, but she alleged that she was terminated instead. Yeah, now this is bringing back memories. Uh, the doc stated that Wayne's team continued to ask her if she was quitting her, quitting after the incident, and that despite saying she wasn't, Medlock got the cold shoulder when trying to return to work. Eventually, she was formally told she was being let go. The former chef says her termination violates a California law that shares it's illegal to fire someone because they missed work to care for their sick or injured child. She sought 500000 in damages. So she got that if they settled. Um, uh, shortly after filing, a spokesperson for the Young Money boss told Neighborhood Talk that Medlock's termination had nothing to do with her family emergency, claiming instead that she was let go due to a breach of privacy. Uh, in a post, in a post sharing the statement, the neighborhood talk pointed to several TikTok posts in which she identified herself as Lowing's private chef. Once she, once such posts found Medlock demonstrating the steps she takes to set up food and snacks on Wayne's private flights, others included captions such as "Chef Morgan flying to cook Lowing dinner" and "Lowing's favorite foods by Chef Morgan." The posts remained on Medlock's publicly accessible TikTok page despite her termination and subsequent so legal action. I do remember seeing those, but I don't know. Maybe the timing was, was just odd at that moment. Maybe she has a point. Maybe, you know. But, yeah, I think privacy needs to go, you know, especially if you're a celebrity. Like, you got to ask, hey, can I post this on my TikTok? Can we, you know, can I do a series where I talk about what Wayne eats on his private jet? And if I set it up, like, just have communication, guys. Like, don't do things behind the scenes and sneak them. And, you know, especially if it's a celebrity, you have to make sure that you're not breaching privacy because these are public figures that there are certain things in their life that they have to have private because if, if somebody finds out what Lil Wayne's favorite food is, right? I'm not saying this is a huge stretch, right? This is a huge, huge stretch. I'm reaching like a motherfucker on this. But let's just say somebody finds out Lil Wayne's food, favorite food. Let's just say it's a turkey sandwich, right? Well, you know, if somebody hates Lil Wayne, they can just poison a turkey sandwich Lil Wayne's favorite food, somehow get it on the plane or at a certain location where he'll eat some turkey sandwich that he likes and to potentially kill him. That's a huge stretch, but that it, they think like security thinks like that because these are public figures with a lot of money that not everybody likes. 
you know, not everybody loves Lil Wayne. I'm sure there's somebody in this, you know, it's kind of weird to think about. There's somebody on this planet that probably hates his guts, can't stand him 24-7. So, you know, I would never go to the lengths of that, even though I don't like Frenchie Montana. But, you know, some people are crazy like that. They'll go to, you know, lengths of that extent to do harm to somebody. So um, that's just a far stretch. But it's stuff like that. Little and routines, too. That's why their privacy... You, People don't want to know about Lil Wayne. Like the, the security doesn't want people to know about Lil Wayne's routines because somebody figures out a Lil Wayne routine, they could follow that routine and potentially get Lil Wayne caught up in something. So, yeah, there's a lot of lot of factors in it, but uh, at least it's settled it's out the way. It's done. She got what she got, and boom, move on. So that's cool that there's a conclusion to this. Before we continue, I want to give a shout-out to Golden Eagle for sponsoring this podcast. Yes, if it wasn't for Golden Eagle – this podcast wouldn't be possible. If you're looking for an energy drink that doesn't tear a hole in your pocket, Golden Eagle Energy Drink is the one you want to get. Golden Eagle has the smoothest taste with no aftertaste. You don't get acid reflex when you drink it, and you will save a lot of money. So check out Golden Eagle at drinkgoldeneagle.com forward slash DMP. The link is in the description below. And how do you think this podcast would be possible without me having energy to do it? Come on, guys. You guys got to remember this. I need energy to do this stuff, man, because there's a lot of crazy topics. So look, look, how, look, how, look how smooth this thing sounds. Look at it. Oh, my God. It's fresh. Look at that golden eagle. Look at the can. It's so beautiful, too, man. Look at that. It's so fresh, man. So fresh. Golden eagle energy drink. Go to the link description below. That's drinkgoldeneagle.com forward slash DMP. Let's continue the episode. Dates on the Young Thug Rico trial. Let's get into it. Young Thug's lawyer, Brian Steele, has filed another memorandum of law in an attempt to get the YSL Rico case tossed out of the court. Uh, according to Law and Crime, who accessed the documents before the statewide Fulton County court outrage, the move comes in the wake of a murder conviction in another Georgia case with ties to hip hop. On Tuesday, March 5th, Morgan Caldwell Baker's conviction in a 2019 shooting of a security guard was thrown out after Georgia's highest court ruled that a music video for Ghetto Angels by No Cap in which Baker waved a gun should not have been played for the jurors tasked with considering the 2019 killing of Tamarco Heed. Steele took note of this and filed a memorandum of law on Thursday, March 7th, in which he requested the judge, Ural Glanville, exclude all evidence related to the use of rap videos, musical lyrics, and the like during the trial. The Honorable Court conditionally admitted evidence of rap videos, musical lyrics, and the like in the trial of this case if the prosecution lay a proper foundation for the same. Steele wrote, Mr. Williams argued that the admission of these items without foundation, that these specific lyrics, videos, words, and other artistic expression violates constitutional and statutory provisions. He continued, without the prosecution knowing who wrote these lyrics at the issue, when the lyrics were written, when the lyrics were produced, when potentially changed any lyrics, um, who potentially changed on the lyrics, what was the intention of the lyrics, what was the mindset of the person speaking the lyrics, so on and so forth, a bunch of lyric stuff, um, and so on and so forth. So they're trying to dismiss it just because of the fact that, you know, of the lyric use, music video use, stuff like that. So we'll see, man. I think they're they're really trying everything in their, their power to make sure Young Thug doesn't get locked up because I'm pretty sure it's not looking good, especially with, that call that we talked about a couple episodes ago where somebody called and saying there's a guy that shot, his name was Young Thug. You know, that's not that's not that's not looking good, man. So uh we'll keep our eye out on this situation. Speaking of another trial case, I know a lot of these are like trials. This should be like honestly hip hop law and order or something, but NBA Young Boys attempt to get the gun charges thrown out, challenged by the feds. So NBA Young Boys attorneys have argued that the federal gun charges brought against them are a violation of his Second Amendment rights, but the government doesn't agree. According to court documents obtained by Hip Hop DX, the federal government filed a motion on Friday, March 8th, in opposition to the rapper's request to have his charges thrown out. The government filing claims that the United States has always engaged in some sort of firearms regulation on both the state and federal level, especially when it comes to keeping firearms out of the hands of felons. On the other hand, the Baton Rouge rapper's attorneys argued that the NBA Young the NBA young boy had the right to bear arms under the recently adjusted case uh, NYS Rifle and Pistol Association Inc. versus Bruin, which ruled that such restrictions on gun possessions were unconstitutional. The feds countered that the Bruin ruling merely redefines the standard for gun ownership but doesn't eliminate restrictions altogether. 
Interesting. So yeah, uh, lawyers are doing the lawyer job once again. So we'll see if that gets if that gets accepted in any way, shape, or form. It's interesting, man. A lot of these judges like have to make decisions, and really, sometimes you'll do a crime. Sometimes somebody will do a crime. And in a different state with a different judge, they'll get way more time. And in a different state, a different judge, they'll get less time. Like I just saw a video because I've been watching a lot of these cop videos where uh, the body cam cop videos where this lady that was pregnant tried to run over uh, the father of that baby that was pregnant because he wanted to break up with her. He wanted nothing to do with her. And she only got like three months uh, probation. That's it. And I had to pay like a, I think a $1,500 fine, something like very low. Um, that's it. But if that happened to another state, which there's videos of like instances like that where somebody tries to run somebody over, they get a year sometimes. They get six months in prison or in jail. Um, and then they do, they got to do community service. They got to pay fees. They, they're on probation. So it's like really depends on what judge you get. That's really all this matters is the judge's opinion at the end of the day, which is stupid, I think. I think there should be a, a standard now, nah, wait, okay, I don't know. If, if there's a set standard on something, it could be, or at least a minimum on something. Like, if it's, you're trying to murder somebody and there's proof, manslaughter, like you're, you're trying to run somebody over, at least a minimum of like three months in jail and then whatever the judge decides to do after that, you got to face some type of time in jail. Like, yeah, so basically that's all it is with a lot of these, even these hip-hop trials. It's about the judge. It's about, you know, what gets presented as evidence. Obviously, we know that, but... You know, lots of, mainly the judge, man. It's, it's the judge, how the judge feels about the situation. That's why I think it was proven there was actually, I talked about this on the podcast a while ago as well. It's been proven that you want the judge to make a decision when they got a stomach full of food. Literally, like that, that that's insane. But if somebody's hungry, they're a lot angrier usually. And they can't think as clearly. And they just make decisions quickly because they're hungry. And that's, that's, that's been statistically studied and proven that, hey, before a judge sentences you, you want to make sure that, that, that they've, been, they've ate good, they've been fed. And shit, I, I don't care what situation I'm in, I'm going to find a way to get 50, 50 to $100 and buy some food for everybody. That way, you know, we get some the best results possible out of the situation. But that, that's how delicate it is with judges. Is like, you know, you could run into a judge that's really cool, smooth, lets you go off. Hey, you made a mistake. It is what it is. You're good. You can run to a judge as a piece of shit and says, fuck you. You're, you're getting whatever the maximum is of whatever you did. So, yeah, I just, I don't know. I just noticed that. It was very interesting. Uh, continuing on, Drake. I wanted to talk about this because I don't know if this is the best move. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if this is the best move. So, Drake has reportedly signed Four Bats. Four Bats is a guy who's been releasing uh, songs called, like, Act 2, Act 3 three like these couple of songs he hasn't even released a project yet and he went viral because he looks gangster if you look at the music video he's very gangster tough everybody's but then when he sings it's like melodic singing smooth it's like the quite opposite it's like the voice is pikachu very fluffy and kind and then the person looks like fucking charizard or some shit that that's a pokemon reference or dragon ball z reference um What's a cute character in Dragon Ball Z, man? I'm over here tripping already. Kid Goku, and then you run into, you know, that looks like, you know, what's an ugly-ass character? Frieza, let's just say Frieza. Frieza's pretty ugly, let's just say that. Frieza, they look like Frieza, but then they look, they're when he talks, he's like Kid Goku, cute and cuddly. So, um, overall, it's, it's interesting because the guy's racked up so many millions of streams with no label. It's like, it's interesting. So, Drake wants, has signed him. But here's the catch here. When I saw that, I was like, why would you do that? Like, as an artist, just don't sign. Because Drake, Drake at the level that he's at, and Eminem got flack from this from Benzino, but I should have mentioned Drake. Drake at the level that he is at has failed. I want to say miserably, but he's failed at launching OVO Records and getting artists, big artists, blown up off that label. Especially at the level Drake's at. Drake could easily co-sign somebody and skyrocket him. He signed, what is it, Party Next Door, I think is the only, like, the biggest artist on OVO. Like, I think that's the only artist on OVO that's, like, been consistent dropping, and he hasn't even blown up like that. So you got, you used to have I Love McConan on a Tuesday, and then you used to have Plaza, so whatever those two guys are, I have no idea. I know I know I love McConan, but Plaza, I have no idea. So you got, 
You got Party Next Door, which is the biggest one, at least the most projects. You got Majid Jordan, which we first heard on Hold On, We're Going Home. You got Roy Woods. You got Division, DVSN. I don't know if you pronounced that right. Baka Not Nice. Pop Can, Smiley, Naomi, Sharon, and then now Four Bats. And to be honest with you, most of these artists have not had much success. Like on a global scale, as like not like a Drake level. I'm not saying that Drake has to find another Drake and the guy has to be a fucking superstar that makes hits for 15 years straight. But it'd be nice if that artist was like at least at a level of, I don't know, like when Wayne signed Drake, Nikki, and Tyga, maybe a Tyga level. Somebody that was like a little up there, you know, or Nicki Minaj level, something like that. Um, but Drake has failed miserably on that. And people say it's because he, he just takes ideas from the artists he signs and doesn't really help them do much. That's why they call it the OVO sweatshop. So that's why when Four Bats signed, I was like, why would you do that? You, know, you got the Drake remix, whatever, cool. But according to the deal, it's only for an EP release. If you guys don't know what an EP is, less than 10 tracks of a project. So a short project, which is good. It's not like he's stuck in it for a while. So um, let's go over the article a little bit more. According to Billboard, the deal was a short-term license uh, it was confirmed by the two execs and follows a bidding war f- uh, for four bats whose hit act two date at eight is making major waves. The track not only racked up 35 million streams for the rising rapper, but also landed on Billboard Hot 100, ultimately climbing to number 59. The warm reception caught the six gods attention leading to official remix. Bats lawyer declined to comment on news. His client is headed to OVO imprint, but mentioned that he made a calculated decision to creatively collaborate with one of the most iconic artists ever. Attorney added that the positive energy and overall support from Team Drake OVO was a driving factor in getting this song released. We are grateful for their involvement and are excited to see what the future holds as a result of epic, creative, and business moves. Spoken like a true fucking lawyer. Um, so yeah, apparently it's a it's a deal just for an EP, uh, nothing more. So that's good, but it's still scary. I hope he doesn't... I don't know, just Drake hasn't had, like I said, Drake hasn't had the record of uh, doing anything special with artists. You know, so... If anybody should be in flack about having their labels flop, is Drake. At least Eminem got 50 Cent off. Like, damn. 50 is literally one of the biggest, like, artists that came out ever. So, at least Eminem got that off. Even though people are saying, oh, 50 already had a buzz going and it was an easy sign. Well, you could kind of say that about Lil Wayne signing Drake. Mind you, guys, let's, let's not forget this. Let's not rewrite history. Drake had best I ever had. It was already doing numbers before he officially signed with Young Money. I'm 100% looked that shit up. When he dropped Best I Ever Had, he was independent. He didn't officially sign. There was a bidding war going on. Ultimately, everybody knew he would eventually sign up to Lil, sign with Lil Wayne. That's just because he had the relationship, blah, blah, blah. Nicki Minaj had a buzz going. Now, not as big as Drake's, but she had a buzz going. So, Tyga already had a little bit of history with the put the lime in the coconut and twist it all up. That record, he had a little bit of history. So, you know, props to Wayne, but at the end of the day, they had something all going. So, I think 50 with G-Unit had the only one where there was no buzz on anybody. Like, think about it. These are all, like, artists that had nothing, no buzz going for them. Game didn't have this insane buzz. I know Game likes to say, oh, yeah, there's West Coast buzz and people... No, Game did not have that insane... Maybe in the West Coast. I don't know. I was in the West Coast, but Game did not have that huge, you know... Even if he had a little buzz, so what? That didn't really do much. Like, 50 really presented him to the world. Banks didn't have a buzz. Obviously, being with G-Unit. Yayo being with G-Unit. Buck being with G-Unit. That helped. That's where the buzz came from. But it's hard to get off an artist, guys. That's the thing. An artist trying to have another artist succeed is a lot harder than just artists succeeding by themselves because now you're tied to this OVO imprint, which can help, but it can also hinder because there's a lot of people that don't fuck with Drake and be like, nah, I ain't fuck with them no more because he's fucking with Drake. But there's a lot of people that fuck with Drake, so it's like, yeah. Uh, I'm just glad it's, 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 you know, it's just an EP deal. We'll see how it goes, man. If he gets scrapped and stuff, we never hear about this guy, then yeah, the OVO sweatshop got him. So we'll keep our eye out. Meek Millie. Now, this, this is how Meek Mill should have responded to all the accusations and, you know, calling him, you know, Fruity Tootie Patootie with Diddy and all that stuff. Uh, they called him a Fruit Pop with Diddy. He should have responded like this. This is the way you respond to all that. Meek Mill pledges support to Philadelphia mayor after mass shooting injures 18s. Should have just responded with doing good things in the community. Not tweeting about it, not addressing allegations. Be like, have you, have you hit the headlines 
with all positive stuff like this. Then everybody would shut up because it's like, okay, this guy's just doing positive stuff. Why are we bothering this guy? Who gives a fuck? That's the way you should have handled it. But continuing on, let's go over the article. Meek Mill has pledged to support Philadelphia Mayor Sherelle L. Parker after a mass shooting left eight teenagers injured. According to NBC Philadelphia, three gunmen opened fire on a bus on Wednesday, March 6th, as high school students waited at the bus stop. Police said seven teenage boys and a teenage girl was shot. One of the victims, a 16-year-old boy, uh, is fighting for his life after being shot nine times. Wow. Uh, while the other seven are in stable condition. Responding to Mayor Parker appearing on the news to say enough is enough in regards to continued violence in the city, Meek said he wanted to be a part of the solution in his hometown. He said this, I want to help her, especially with education. He wrote on X, I have dreams of working with the Yas Foundation, with Dream Chasers Academy to offer these kids resources with technology and to travel outside of that environment to understand life. I'm in on reform. I'm going to join helping with education. He added, if you black or brown talk about this, it's kids that are going to pick up guns because they think they're going to die before they turn 21 for a gun license. You will go to you will go from Xbox to Glock because of your environment and get locked up for trying to survive, but it's terrible. The rapper also called on people to not follow bad examples set by their elders. Growing up around killers that won't reason with you before they kill you is like trying to negotiate with the terrorists. In our city, we used, we used, in our city, we used to death. We used to death, okay? And currently going through something with everybody killing everybody. It's hard to focus or prosper. Do not follow the heathens. Uh, nice album or EP plug there, Meek. But yeah, I agree, man. Like I said, if he if he had responded, like Meek does a lot of great things, man. He'll have moments where he does a lot of great things with the community and it shouldn't go overlooked because all this stupid stuff that happens. But Meek Mill makes it, makes people overlook it because you're going on Twitter and addressing these stupid things and the way you're addressing them is just in a clownish way. You know, it's like, you know, it backfires. So he should have just responded by doing this. You know, don't post anything on social media. Post your project after that. Do good for the community. Nobody can really say anything at that point. If anybody criticizes you for that, it's like they're just hating, straight up to hate. So, yeah, round of applause for Meek Mill, man. Very dope of him to do that. Kanye West, we did not get the new Vultures album, but there's a pretty valid reason, man. It's one, he didn't finish it completely, but uh, he's like me, swear to God. I, I always say I'm going to do something, finish it, but it doesn't come out when it's supposed to. That's usually life. But Kanye has decided that potentially... He doesn't want to release the album on streaming platforms. He said this. He messaged a Kanye fan page called Yay Fanatics. Shout out to them. And said this. About like what's going on with. They, they asked what's going on with the release. Blah, blah, blah. This is what Kanye said. Was talking with the team about how to release the next album. Like James Blake said. Streaming devalues our music. We sell albums on Yeezy.com. I got 20 million Instagram followers. When 5% of my followers buy an album. That's 1 million albums sold. That's 300,000 more than the biggest album last year. We sold 1 million items on Yeezy.com on Super Bowl Sunday, so we know it's possible. How do you feel about us not streaming and only selling the album digitally? Well, first, Kanye. Um, that's not how Instagram works. 5% of your followers will not do that. Let's just say that. You can never get 5% of your followers to do anything. There's people that have 100 million followers and 5% don't even like their posts. That's just not how it goes. That doesn't go any 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 platform, by the way, not just Instagram. Look at my YouTube channel. 600-something thousand, 675,000 subscribers. There are videos I release that only get 10,000 views. It just doesn't, it doesn't translate all the time. Like, all those followers are not going to watch everything. Same with the podcast. Same with everything that I do. Same with you, Kanye. You're a big voice. It's great, but the chances of 5% of those followers buying the album is slim to none. Because 20 million followers, let's just say about 5 million are inactive or people lost their accounts or those people never visit Instagram anymore, whatever the case may be. About 5 million is probably that. I'm willing to bet. I know that's a crazy number to think. Let's just say 3 million. Then you got another 5 million that probably just hate you and don't really... That's that's another thing about Instagram. Not everybody that's following you loves you. Some people just hate you. I have followers that just randomly hate on my shit for no reason. It's like, what the fuck? I didn't do nothing to you, but they just hate what I post and share, so they just hate. So... You get that. So not all the followers are their supporters. Then you get ones that aren't really active and look into Instagram and like look at you consistently. That's another thing. So there's a lot of factors into it. And not, not everybody's going to like the music and buy it just because you're Kanye doesn't mean that they're going to buy it. But um, I here's why I like the whole independent route Kanye is going. I've always given him props for that with this run, with this Vultures run. But 
I don't like Kanye's commitment when it comes to releasing certain projects. Like Donda 2, I really loved as an album. But that shit only came out on his little circle thing that he had that he released. And that's it. We never got on streaming platforms, never got a proper release for it. And I don't want that happening with this album. I don't want it to just be a Yeezy.com release where the album comes out on there and then nothing really sprouts out of it. You know, like that, that's, that's a high chance of that happening. And I'm not a fan of that. And mind you, now Kanye, I think he's saying digitally downloaded though. Because he's talking about physical CDs. That's going to cost money to make. So you're going to be spending a lot more money just making the CDs than doing streaming. But I mean, you could potentially make more money off selling the CDs. And he's, he is offering also the price point of the CD or digital download. I don't know which one it's going to be. It's $20 for it. Which I know back in the day, that was not the standard, but if you got like a digital deluxe, or like not digital deluxe, but if you got a deluxe version of albums, pretty much $20, sometimes $25. Most albums would average around $12, maybe $13 to $16. I remember at least from buying albums around there. That's where my price points were, where I was living. Um, it would be rare if it got 20 If it got 20 it was like a special DVD added to it or $25, special DVD package, whatever. And sometimes it would not be that high, even with the DVD package. Um I like the approach, Kanye, but, you know, how about do this? Do drop it on there and then drop it on iTunes for us to buy as well and not streaming. I'll do that. I'll buy it off iTunes if the music sounds good. But Kanye, you know, I'm happy with Vulture's one. I'm pretty happy with it. I gave it a 6.5 out of 10. That's not a bad rating, I think. I think that's a fair, that's a good album rating. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I am I'm, get Kanye's trying to do new things and not having to go through different platforms. And once He wants consumers just to go directly to him which is a lot harder to do. It takes a lot more. I know Kanye's Kanye, but even Kanye being Kanye, it's going to be a lot harder to do. Uh, anything direct consumer is hard to get people to, to do. It's just, I don't know why it's, it's a hell like me. I would love if I created diverse mentality.com and had my own videos on their own advertisement, own everything. And everybody went there and watched and nobody ever went on YouTube and nobody ever went on Instagram, none of these platforms and just went straight to my website and watched all my content. That's it. I would make a lot more money, but people aren't gonna aren't willing to go a bunch of different platforms to just watch. Imagine if every creator did that, just had their own pr- platform direct to consumer. That's why we got things like YouTube, Instagram, all these platforms to have everything in one place. That way, if you want to go on YouTube to my channel, you can go to somebody else's channel immediately like that. If you're on a different website, you got to type in a different website, go to that person, blah, blah, blah. So it's a lot longer of a process, but direct to consumer is a lot trickier too. There's a lot of logistics problems with that as well, but... uh I'm all for it. I'm excited for Vultures 2. Like I said, Vultures 1 to me. Um, I'm happy with the album pretty much. Uh, I think I think the most impressive thing about all this is that Kanye West is still relevant 20 years later. Mind you, it came out in 2004. It's 2024. I know we talk about Drake's run. And I know we talk about Eminem. And to be honest with you, Eminem and Jay-Z haven't really like impacted culture like that. Like If we're being honest, they haven't impacted culture that much anymore they don't do it anymore dre dropped 444 people were talking about for a little bit moved on uh eminem dropped music to be murdered by moved on when he dropped kamikaze though he did you know that was something that like everybody was like whoa because it had a bunch of disses and so he did impact culture in 2018 jay-z didn't do it in 2017 i think the last eight last time jay-z like impacted culture off his album was that magna carta holy grail and that was like in 2013 so it's been a minute since like but they're always going to sell records. Eminem, J, they're always going to sell records. But impacting, like, where everybody's like, yo, just stop. We're all going to listen to this. We're all going to... I 444, people listen to it, but it just didn't really stick or do anything. Um, Kanye, though, has been doing a lot of things where everybody's been watching. Everybody's been joining in. Everybody's been talking about it 20 years later. So Kanye needs to get his props for that. But uh, good luck to him with this, man. He's going back and forth on this stuff. He's changing. He's saying, I, I'll figure out this. He's asking fans what they think. I don't mind going on iTunes and purchasing it digitally. I'm fine with that. Any artist I support, I actually do that anyways. Like Lloyd Banks will drop on streaming and on iTunes, and I'll actually buy it off iTunes just to give them direct money, direct support. I do that with a lot of artists I really like. You know, any artist I really, really like, I will directly. J. Cole drops an album. Kendrick dropped an album. I bought directly from there. I didn't just stream it. Um, I feel like that's warranted. You should do that. If it's an artist you really like and you have the means to do it, obviously just spend the extra 13, 14 bucks, even though it's on, it's on streaming, just support a little extra support would be cool. So, um, yeah, that's it. We'll keep, we'll, we'll keep our eye on this and see, you know, what, what happens.
Uh, speaking of music, New Music Friday, a bunch of artists released uh, an NBA M Boy comp compliments of Grave Digger Mountain album. Um, Ariana Grande dropped Eternal Sunshine, Four Bats of Drake, Act Two, Date at Eight. The remix came out. Drake jumped on that. That's really about it. How much music really dropped from my radar, at least. Um, album sales, Morgan Wallen, one thing at a time. This album's been on the charts for so long. It's back to number one. That's how long it's been on the charts. It is at 67,000 sold, back to number one. Kanye West and Ty Dolla Sign's Vultures is back to number two at 53,000 sold. Noah Khan Stick Season, number three with 52,000 sold. SZA SOS, number four with 46,000 sold. Drake for All the Dogs, number five with 42,000 sold. Taylor Swift, 1989, number six with 40,000 sold. Taylor Swift, Lover, number seven with 38,000 sold. Zach Bryan, self-titled album at number eight with 37,000 sold. Morgan Wallen, Dangerous the Double Album, number nine with 37,000 sold. Travis Scott, Utopia, number 10 with 35,000 sold. 21 Savage, American Dream at number 11 with 35,000 sold. Schoolboy Q's Blue Lips album debuted at number 13 with 34,000 sold. That's not bad, man. That's pretty good numbers. Um, going down the list, Nicki Minaj, Pink Friday 2 at number 25 with 22,000 sold. Drake, Take Care, number 28 with 21,000 sold. Eat 2093 at number 32 with 20,000 sold. Scissor Control, number 33 with 20,000 sold. Lil Baby My Turn, number 35 with 19,000 sold. Metro Boomin' Heroes and Villains, they did announce, Metro Boomin' announced the collab album Future, dropping pretty soon, I think end of April or end of March and then like mid-April, something like that, they announced the Metro Boomin' and Future album. So Metro Boomin' Heroes and Villains, number 38 with 18,000 sold. Rod Wave Nostalgia, number 39 with 18,000 sold. Eminem Curtain Call, number 42, with 17,000 sold. Kendrick Lamar, Damn, and number 49, with 16,000 sold. By the way, when I say 16,000, all these numbers, it's like 16,704, but it's just too much to say, so I just say 16,000. That's the gist of it. Um, and that's it for today's episode of the Diverse Mentality Podcast. As always, appreciate you guys. Support Golden Eagle Energy Drink powered they're powering this podcast sponsoring it for all of season four go to drinkgoldeneagle.com forward slash dmp get you a 24 pack support them leave them a review on amazon we appreciate them for sponsoring the podcast spotify deezer podcast youtube all that show support i appreciate it. it means the world to me have an amazing night day whenever you listen to this and peace